All right, guys. So welcome. Uh, this call is all about the biggest mistakes that freelancers make uh, that prevents them from getting high paying clients. Uh, interesting. This is something that Steph and I witnessed with a lot of the freelancers that are in our Copy Accelerator and Copy Accelerator Light group. Um, we've coached a lot of them on how to get better at this, not applying for jobs and how to actually go after jobs so that you can get them so you can avoid some of these mistakes and kind of decided this would be a good topic for a lot of freelancers because the reality is for a lot of freelancers, they're missing out on jobs, not because of their quality of their copy, but it's because of the way they're applying for the jobs. Uh, so we're going to hit on a bunch of that. So there's a lot of mistakes we're going to go over. I came up with four or five. Stefan has, I think, four or five. We've got a bunch of examples. We also have a bunch of bonus guests today. Usually it's just Stefan and I on these, but we brought in a bunch of the freelancers from uh, our Copy Accelerator and Copy Accelerator Light groups. Uh, so we have, you can see their pictures up at the top. We have Krista, we have Jared, we have Sam Novak, we have Tom Clayson, we have Cody Griffin, and we have Rob Tidwell. Um, so this is going to be a pretty free flowing uh, kind of webinar. Uh, we definitely want to have uh, you guys chime in. If there's anything we're talking about that you have kind of direct experience with, feel free to chime in, share a story. Uh, just kind of keep the, I would say keep the stories, I don't know, two minutes or less. Don't tell a long droning on story for 10 minutes and bore the whole place and the webinar just leaves. Um, <laughs> uh, but besides that, uh, we'll jump into it. Stefan, anything you want to add before we get into it? No, I'm stoked. So. All right, so we'll do a quick intro here. Uh, for those of you who don't know Stefan and I, so I started uh, back in internet marketing in 2005 when I was in college. Uh, I learned how to make websites. Uh, basically because I had a $1,200 gambling debt that I could not pay. And I had this bright idea that I was going to make a website and sell my gambling picks online. Uh, that turned out to be a horrible idea and it did not work. And I basically did not make any money for a long time. Um, and, but eventually I made a sale. Uh, then eventually that kind of got me into affiliate marketing, which led me to copywriting and creating products. And over the years, I, I, I've built, uh, I think, four different multi-million dollar businesses at this point. Uh, I was a freelance copywriter for a couple of years. Um, and yeah, Stefan and I now run a program called Copy Accelerator, where we coach offer owners, entrepreneurs, uh, and copywriters, and teach them how to make more money, have more freedom in their life. So that's a little about me. I'll let Stefan do a little synopsis of, of himself. Yeah, for sure. Um, by the way, I know a couple of people have mentioned they can't see the panelists right now. Um, I'm sure when the panelists talk, you'll be able to see them. But if there's any setting, Justin, you might want to mess with that while I'm talking. Um, but yeah, my background, uh, for those of you who don't know, is um, as a freelancer. I mean, I got into freelancing after meeting my wife at a poker table. So there's a commonality with gambling, which is actually saying that a lot of there's like a lot of origin stories for marketers that, that are related to casinos for some reason it's almost like the the dopamine and allure of easy money and all that other stuff plays some kind of role i mean um and the shocking twist but um yeah some people are saying i used to work in a casino um anyway yeah so uh but yeah so i mean you know i started out i used to charge 149 dollars per sales letter and, and also i've talked about this before but i like really coming coming up i would do any task I could get. So I wrote people's like college papers for them. I did all kinds of market research. I wrote blogs for like cloud, like um, like virtual like web server companies and like logistics companies. I wrote web copy. Um, I literally used to do, you know, anything. Well, it turns out it wasn't that easy money when you're writing a bunch of like a uh, logistics copy. But um, yeah, I mean, over time was able to, to, you know, get to where I'm today where I charge 50,000 bucks for the same you know, sales letter that I used to charge $149 for. And um, I do still actively freelance some, it's a constant kind of battle, but at the same time, and that like, you know, I, I'm running businesses just like Justin, I've, I've started, I don't know, close to 10, if not 10 businesses that have done at least seven figures a year, several of them have done eight figures and a couple of have hit nine. Um, but I do love freelancing. I love teaching, talking about it. I am actively working with our Copy Accelerator members and then, you know, and everyone else and just trying to help them to have more success. Um, it's a passionate kind of uh, area for me. So I'm excited to share some of that wisdom. Sweet. All right, let's, uh, we'll jump into it. Can you guys see the panel attendees now? I made everybody a co-host, so I don't know if you can see them now. 
I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. Can you see them when they actually talk? Talk, Sam. Can you talk, and we'll see if you show up. Here, I'm mute. I tried to do the space bar thing, and it didn't cooperate with me. <laughs> cool. There you are. Okay, so you guys can see them when they talk. So that, that's fine. We'll call it really um, All right, we're gonna dive into this. Like I said, Steph and I both uh, put together some stuff that we want to share. I will warn you in advance, this is not a pretty presentation by any means. It is the good old reliable Google Doc. Um, but do not dismiss what you're about to learn because of how ugly it is, so. <laughs> it is on the inside, you know? Inside the content. It's like a, it's like a great converting sales page that's ugly as shit. That's <laughs> um, Stefan, do you want to handle the chat in case there's anything that pops up that I need to address? Yeah, absolutely. Increased size to 125%, said Elizabeth. So, which right. makes sense. Good, good suggestion, Elizabeth. All right. So, we're going, like I said, we're going over major mistakes freelancers make that prevent them from consistently landing high paying copy jobs. And again, any of the panelists that want to chime in on any of this stuff, if you've got a story that relates to anything here, feel free to. So, one that I want to talk about that happened to me recently hiring a copywriter is not delivering on your first shot. So like a lot of things in life, you get one shot with a new client. Um, you should really do everything you can to blow them away with your copy. One part of that is delivering it on time. Uh, and every copywriter says they try to deliver it on time, but I would say 80% never deliver stuff on time. Uh, one, one of the easiest ways to stand out as a copywriter is literally to deliver stuff on time. Um, and you really can kind of think of this like a first date, like if you're on a first date and you half ass it and you don't care and you're drinking too much and you're making rude comments, there's probably not going to be a second date. Same thing goes with the copy barring you being so goddamn unbelievable at copy and you get them a 6% conversion rate and they make tens of millions of dollars, then they'll, they'll put up with your shit then, but the large majority of people won't put up with, uh, you kind of not delivering what you're supposed to and not delivering it on time. Um, like I said, this is all very simple, but it, it's shocking the number of copywriters who can't deliver stuff on time. So I, I want to give you an example. Um, I hired a copywriter to write our, uh, write the emails for the launch I did for my thousand buyers a day. Basically I had way too much stuff on my plate and I, I didn't have time to write the emails. So I was like, I need someone to write this and I'm going to clean up maybe the last 10% of it. Um, basically I was like, I needed it by Christmas. So he had about seven days to do it. Um, uh, he, here's kind of the exchange we had. I, I'm going to show this to you as an illustration of what not to do. Um, uh, I'm not trying, I took, I took the person's name out of this. So, um, I'm not trying to like shame him for what he did here, but, uh, more of an illustration of what not to do as a freelance copywriter. So he sent me a message on December 25th, which was Christmas, the day that it was due. Hope you're having a great week away from your computer. Just wanted to give you a quick update. All five emails will be ready by the end of the day today, U.S. time. Merry Christmas. I'm like, okay, sounds good. Next morning, I send him an email because when I wake up, I don't see the email. I'm like, well, he said they were going to be here last night. They didn't show up. So I sent him an email next morning. I said, did you send the email at 8 a.m.? No answer. I sent him another email at 6 p.m. Question mark. I get an email back. After that one, about an hour later, says, I'm terribly sorry, Justin. I went into a deep rabbit hole while trying to surprise you with a few extra angles. May I deliver everything in 13 to 14 hours from now, early sending morning with you, to your time. If you'll have notes for me, I'll be available all Sunday and Monday to work on the revisions. My apologies. So at this point, as an offer owner, this is already a bad start. Uh, you promised them on one day. And it's one thing, too, if you, if you say, I'm going to have this to you by March 21st and then I don't know March like 7th comes along and you're like hey can I I need a few extra weeks most people are okay with that uh, but when you're when it's due and then you're saying I need more time that's really bad communication on the part of the copywriter and especially like I said you get one shot to make a first impression and this was the first time I'd ever hired this person uh, so this is not a great way to kind of start out that relationship so he sends me this one if it I'll have it to you, blah, 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 by Sunday morning, your time. Okay. I say, yes, send them tomorrow morning. 
this is the next when I when he says oh, I'm getting him the next morning, I'm assuming I'm going to wake up at 7:30, 8 o'clock, and they're gonna be there in my inbox. So I get online at like eight o'clock and there's nothing there. So now I'm like raging because this is the second time you said it's gonna be here and it's not here. Um so I email him back, say, please send these over. And then this guy is actually one of our copy seller light people. So I gave him some feedback as a coach. And this is kind of obviously an awkward position for me to be in because I hired him, but I'm also a coach. So I kind of gave him some tough love here. I'm like, FYI, as a freelancer, the worst thing you can do is promise something will be done on a certain date and then not deliver. It's even worse if I give you more time and you still don't deliver, i.e. you said, You'd have the emails for me early this morning. It's currently 11 a.m. I still don't have them. I really hope you don't operate like this with your other clients, because if you do, it's hurting you and preventing you from getting future work. Uh, and that was 100% the truth. Like, if, if he's operating like this with other clients, it's killing him from getting future work. So then I get an email back from him at 11 a.m. Basically says, uh, I'm really sorry. You're right. I got into analysis paralysis mode because this is a project for you. And all these other big name people were going to be using the emails. Uh, and I really wanted to make them great. So he sends over what's complete so far, which is only two out of the five emails. And he said, I'll put the finishing touches on the next ones in a couple hours. Um, blah, 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 blah. So at this point, I'm super pissed because not only does he only have, not only has it not been delivered, but only two of them out of the five. So just really bad um, on his end. And I basically just sent him an email ending the project at that point. So I was like, I'm gonna have my assistant pay you. This project's gonna be done. If you haven't finished any other emails, don't bother. I'm gonna write them myself. As a word of advice as your coach, I highly recommend that you communicate better with your other clients. Continuously telling someone the project will be done at a certain point and then not delivering is the absolute worst thing you can do. And it happened three times on this project. Um, I told him I hired a lot of copywriters. I've never really had an experience as bad as this one. So not delivering on time is one thing, but continuously telling me things will be done soon and they're not done is incredibly frustrating for a business owner. It's my hope that me telling you this will help you make, will help you not make this mistake again in the future. Um, one good note on his end, he actually refused to be paid for the project, which kind of gave him some good graces in my eyes. Uh, I mean, I was going to pay him anyways, because I always do, but, um, I think that was a smart move on his part. If you screw up royally, uh, just take the lump and you, you kind of would look like a jackass if you took the money at that point. Um, but anyways, I wanted to share that example because like I said, not delivering on your first shot. He got, this was his first shot with me. Um, and like I said, you get more lead way as you go on with a client. If I had been working with him for, five different projects and all the other projects he did great and then this happened yeah i'd be upset but not a huge deal like I, I would i would be like okay probably the next time he's going to deliver but on your first shot um like i said it's just like a first date you really have to be your best um you can't be half-assing it and steph and i can attest to this uh i don't know if mario's on this call mario castelli who's in our group Mario wrote the first sales page for our, our first live company accelerator event and knocked it out of the park. And Stefan, how many times have we hired Mario since then? Uh, like five or six. I've hired him for some stuff personally as well. We probably paid him close to like, oh, like I don't know what, like $60,000 or more between the two of us for stuff, maybe even more. Yeah, I would say probably um, closer to 100. Uh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, he's written a bunch of my stuff too for my, my newsletter and all that. Mario knocked it out of the park on the first one. He was a pleasure to work with. Um, everything about that experience was good. And it led to probably seven to 10 more gigs. Um, that's kind of what, that's the difference between delivering on the first time and not delivering on the first time. So if anybody on the panel wants to chime in on this, if you got anything to add, I would love to hear it. I do, yeah, I want to real quick, our, our panel has been killing it in the chat and a bunch of really good observations. Um, I have some thoughts too, but you know what, let me let our panel go. So if uh, Sam, Krista, um, Heidi, I mean, a bunch of you were sharing stuff and, and Cody. Um, so feel free to jump in and share some thoughts. I, I have a thought. Um, so one thing that I just want to sort of like 
contextualize this because coming from Justin, it may seem like, I'm sure that there are a lot of newer copywriters on this, on this call, right? And so when he says not delivering on your first shot, I guarantee that to some people that can sound like super uh, intimidating. You know what I mean? Like, oh shit, if I don't deliver like a level copy to someone like Justin or to my client, I'm screwed. And then that's going to put even more pressure on people. So just go into this with the context that your first shot, like delivering your best on your first shot is not the same for every single person at every single point of their journey as a copywriter. And that depending on who your client is, um, you know, like my first big client, my first big name client, I went through <laughs> seven drafts of a sales letter with him and my first draft was total garbage. But like going into the deal, he knew that I was new. I set that up to not make him think that I'm some pro level copywriter. Like he knew that he was going to have to invest time, but in exchange, he didn't pay me a lot of money and I was okay with that, right? So just I, I just wanted to put that out there because there's no reason for, for you to feel a ton of pressure outside of the delivering on time and just doing the best that you can, obviously. Yep, good insight. Anybody else want to add anything? Yeah, I got one real quick. <clears throat> maybe you can learn from my mistake. Um, it was a dumb mistake. <laughs> so maybe you would have made it, but um, make sure you ha actually have a timeline or a deadline with your client because there was one time there was like, oh, we didn't set a deadline. And like, there's no rush on this. This is like long term. <clears throat> well, you and your client might have a different idea of what long term is. And honestly, it kind of like, I'm not working with that client today because I feel like things just went badly. And that's the one and only client that I've ever felt like I didn't deliver for. And it was simply because I didn't set a deadline and the expectations right out of the gate. So don't be all free willy nilly like that because it could bite you in the ass. Yeah, I think that's a good insight too. A, couple, um, a few notes I wanted to make, Sam pointed out in the chat, but it's like, if you look at me with my client work for like VSLs and stuff, I almost always quote eight weeks, even though I can write a sales letter in like two days if I really want to just do nothing but that. Um, but I say weeks because I know much other shit's going to come up, but then I don't wait till the last minute. I am working on like, you know, I'll take a week or seven to 10 days is what I really take to like do a letter, but I'm doing like two hours every morning for the, that stretch of time. Um, but yeah, overestimating how much time you'll need. And, and um, you know, Sam mentioned it, uh, Rob just backed it up. Brian mentioned something about it too, I believe. Um, and so I think that's really important. And another, you know, just to reiterate too, the whole idea of like, like this, and it's kind of funny cause like just, I've had the same experience as Justin where I hire somebody and then they're like, I just got freaked out because I'm ready. It's actually hard to hire people because it's like, oh, they people know who I am, right? In our in our like kind of industry or space. So then they get really like freaked out and they they feel this extra pressure and they sort of end up self-sabotaging. This happens like a, a lot, like probably half the people I hire. It's very <laughs> kind of difficult. But like it's like if you to what uh Jared just said, it's like if you deliver something to me and it's got some potential, but it's not like perfect. I'm probably gonna be like, hey, cool. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Here's some things I'd like you to address. Like, right, like, can you fix this? Can you change this? What about doing this? I'll, the worst case scenario, I'm gonna give you feedback. I mean, if it's really bad, I'm not gonna hire you again, but I'm not gonna like think really negatively of you, but I'll probably give you feedback um, and, you know, and, and work with you because I want to be successful. But as soon as you do what that person did to Justin, it's like, I'm never gonna hire you again. So it's like, if you're, your whole fear is like screwing it up with me or with your client, whoever it is, but it's like, look, Every time you do what that, that person did to Justin, you screw it up every time, hundred percent of the time you screw it up. But if you give me something and it's like, you know, pretty good, then there's still a decent chance that, that we work together, you improve it. You know, I like you we, and we work together more in the future. So it's just a really big, um, really big difference. So that, yeah, like, like, like what uh, the Carlin quote that I think Sam put in there, how like, what was like the project done is better than project none or something like that. Um, but yeah, I want to add that as well. I have something to add too. <clears throat> Please. Um, I've definitely made the mistake a lot of times with a new client. I want to be really 
agreeable and like, you know, basically what happens is I overpromise, um, especially on the timeline. I'll be like, oh yeah, I can get that done in a few days. And then I realize, oh no, I should have asked for like two weeks. And then I'm kind of in that embarrassing position. I put myself in of having to come back and be like, oh, I need more time. Usually they're nice about it, but it's way better to avoid that completely. But that's part of the pressure of like wanting to impress this new client. And I've fallen into that trap a lot. Yeah, Heidi, that's, that's a really good point. I actually wanted, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause yeah, I think um, a lot of us have a tendency to want to please people and to your point or impress them. And so it's like, okay, I'll get that done in 24 hours. Like they didn't ask for 24 hours, right? They were just like, you could have said seven days and they would have been fine. But we have this tendency to want to do that because it'll make them happy. But we, we create almost artificial deadlines and put this pressure on ourselves that just doesn't need to be there. And then we set ourselves up for failure. I think I've seen a lot of people do that. And it's like, it's, yeah, like to Rob's point, he said, it's so tempting to fall into that trap. Um, so you're definitely not alone in doing it, Heidi, but you're smart in that you recognize it and, and have kind of figured out how to stop doing that. But I think that's a really important tip for a lot of people is like, um, not creating artificial deadlines for yourself and then failing to meet them. It's kind of another self-sabotage thing, even though it's definitely not intentional or anything. I've got one quick thing to add. Please. Um, a lot of this, I think, comes down to knowing yourself and what you're capable of, but also knowing the caliber of the client that you're working with, right? Like writing something for Justin or Stefan you're going to be critiqued, not just on the timing of it, but of the copy itself at a lot higher level than your kind of run of the mill client. And so I've jumped at the opportunity to write something for Justin myself. I like to think I'm at that level where that's going to be a good mesh. It's going to be good feedback for me. It's going to be a good learning thing. Um, but you just kind of have to know what you're going into. Like you got to know if you're at the caliber that maybe you want to be at, but you're not quite yet. And maybe you bit off more than you could chew by even taking that job in the first place. So the more you know yourself, your skills, but also the standard that you're going to be judged, the easier it is to avoid these mistakes. Yeah, that's a great point, Cody. On that front too, I just wanted to add, because something I think that a lot of us do uh, when you're trying to land a client, like you try and hype yourself up in a sense, where you're like, yeah, I can totally do that. I can do all this great stuff. I've done all this previous stuff in the past. And basically you kind of like oversell yourself and create all those expectations. And it's basically if you weren't clear with your client about what your, your real history was or how uh, experienced you are, right? So let's say like when I landed my biggest client to date for a single project, it was basically just like, you know, you know, do you want to write the sales letter? And I'm like, absolutely, I want to write it. But I was upfront from the beginning that like, hey, I've never written a sales letter like this before. I'm confident I can do it. I have these tools. I have our MVC method. At the time I was in Coffee Accelerator full, you know what I mean? But I wasn't trying to pretend like I had skills or experiences like that that I didn't have, which doesn't set up that expectation gap that you then feel like you're struggling to meet the entire time. So you get like frozen in the headlights and then you don't meet your deadlines because now you're just scared to turn something in because you know it's not going to meet that expectation essentially. So it's like, just be clear and honest with people and be a human being um, and don't try and talk yourself up into something that you're maybe not if you're not there yet. There's a difference between like having a confidence and going for something and pretending to be something that you're not, right? That's interesting. So I have I have a kind of a, a different take on it. I, I totally get where you're coming from, but when we get to my take, I will I want to have a little bit more of a conversation on that that thought because like I think there's two sides to this for sure. Um, let's uh right. let's jump to yeah. the second one. I think we have how many do you have stuff? You got like five of them. I got like five of them. And so the bonus ones are pretty short, but I have like I think three that are with a bunch of kind of in depth examples that I really want to go through. But obviously we'll get to them. But yeah. Okay. So second big mistake. You're a pain in the ass who needs hand holding all the way through a project. Um, I luckily have not hired many of these people, um, but I have done it before, and it's it's really a, a worst case scenario for the business owner because the reason I'm hiring a copywriter is because I have too much on my plate already. I want to turn everything over to you, and I want you to take the project from start to finish, and then. Maybe I'll clean up a little bit at the end, uh, but mostly I really want it done for me. I don't really want to have to do anything. Uh, if it turns into more work for me, if you're coming back to me all the time with emails saying, well, I got these couple ideas and I have this idea and I'm thinking about maybe going this way, or what do you think of this? To me, that's, that's more than I'm willing to take on. Um, 
I will do it on certain projects, especially if I'm working with a copywriter who I haven't worked with before. I'll say, write the first, give me, send me like a one sheet on what your idea is and what your angles are that you're going to do. Uh, and then send me a two page lead so that I can see what kind of direction you're going. And then from there, you're off the races on your own. And I'm not going to sit here and hold your hand. Basically, we'll do like one call or one email to kind of kick it off. Um, and then after that, you're kind of on your own. Um, all the best, like I said, I'll go back to Mario, who Steph and I have hired a bunch. He's a Copy Accelerator member. Uh, Mario, we basically give him, I don't know, one email with a couple hundred words that give him kind of the logistics of everything we need. And Mario just comes back to us with finished copy in four weeks. Uh, and there's usually pretty much nothing that needs to be changed about the copy. Uh, that's kind of the ideal scenario that, that you're looking for as a, as a business owner. Uh, someone who needs the handholding all the time, it's, it's, oh man, it's just really not great for, for the offer owner because it just, it sucks more of my attention and my time away from the other stuff that I need to focus on. The reason I'm hiring you is because I, I need to be able to focus on that stuff and not focus on the copy. So that's a big one for me. Stefan, anything you want to add on the, uh, people who need too much handholding? I just, you know, it's a strong agree. Um, I did, you know, a YouTube video about this and, and kind of one of the things, one of the tells there is asking like so many questions. Like I think um, freelancers start continuing to ask questions because they're almost like they're trying to put off actually starting the project and there's a lack of confidence and this sort of like, it makes them feel more in control by asking more questions and more questions, but really you just start to annoy the client. Um, but I also just strongly agree going back to like, I mean, again, maybe this is a little bit, you know, uh, unique to myself and, and to you, Justin, but being like well-known copywriters, copy coaches, copy mentors. Um, I've had that experience again where you hire people and then they want you to look over everything and give them feedback and approve it. And it's like, to your point, I've literally said this line to people, I don't know, at least 10 times in the last year where it's like, Hey, like I hired you to, to do this. Like I didn't, I don't, I don't want to have to like, I, you know, I could have done it myself. Like I, like I'm hiring you as the expert to get this done for me. So get it done for me. And you're not trying to be like a, a dick, but to your point, it's like, okay, I can write, I can write it. I'm hiring you to, to, to save me time. So if you suddenly take all my time, cause you're like, is this good or not? Should I do this? Should I prove this? What do you think of this lead? What do you think of this lead? What do you think of this? It's like, dude, like, why did I hire you? Right. Um, and I, I, I know I'm not the only person who feels that way even further, you know, big offer owners and stuff like that. You just have, it really comes down to confidence. And I mean, I, it goes back to two to like, what's the worst case scenario that doesn't work. Okay. Well, there's still a chance it's not going to work. Even if you have like perfect information from the client, like it still might not work, right? Like not everything works. Like you can bat like 300, you're going to have a really long and lucrative career as a copywriter. If you can bat 500, you're going to be an all timer, you know, like a lot of your shit's not going to work anyway. You have to get over that fear of failure because no one client is going to be that make or break person. Like, yeah, it's great. But I can't tell you how many times I had some person I was gonna work with, especially early on where I thought it was like my big break and I worked my ass off for it. And then like the copy never launched or launched and did good, but they still didn't hire me or it didn't do good. I mean, like no one person is gonna be your big break until maybe they are, but like, you're not gonna know it until it happens. And it's gonna be somebody you totally don't expect at all. Um, you know, it's, it's not like we hype up these opportunities in our heads so much, but reality is that um, it's more about rep, it's getting the reps in, right? With more repetition, then you're likely to have get better outcomes over time um, versus just like trying to like have this this fear of, of putting any client on like a pedestal, basically. Yep. Cool. Uh, I'm gonna keep going because we've got a bunch here uh, to get into. Um, if any of the panelists want to chime in on this one, uh, we can do that. So number three, the reason you're not landing enough high paying clients is you're not doing enough outreach, you're not doing enough networking. So if you don't have enough clients right now, you're, you're simply not doing enough outreach. Um, because if you're doing enough outreach, you probably have clients. Um, this obviously boils down to kind of two things. It's you need to have the skill first, which is something Stefan and I talk about all the time. Uh, you can't be reaching out to clients if you have no copy skills whatsoever. If you have no copy skills whatsoever, take a couple months, write every single day and improve your copy skills. Once you have some type of skill, then you can help people. It might be a very low level client, might be doing very low level work, 
but you at least have some skills there. Um, if you have no skills whatsoever, it doesn't matter how much outreach you're doing, you're, you're not going to get clients. Um, like I said, kind of tying this back in, we, we used the dating example earlier. Uh, if you never go out on the weekends, if you never go on Tinder, you're not going to find a boyfriend or girl. You're not going to be dating because you're not putting yourself out there at all. Client, and same thing with clients. Clients don't just show up at your house and knock on the door and be like, hey, I'm looking for a copywriter. People, that doesn't happen. Um, and like I said, it's very similar. It's very similar, although actually, I guess it's similar to dating for men. The women probably will not relate to this because women just get hit on all the time. Um, <laughs> it's actually, so for men, if you're not actually putting yourself out there, if you're not talking to women, the chances of you actually dating someone are very, very slim, barring you being famous. Uh, because people don't, <laughs> Heidi said, I have a potential client slide in my DM. <laughs> <Nice>. um, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you really need to be doing more outreach. So if you're, if you're focused on writing all day, every day, and you're not an actual outreach to potential clients is not part of your, uh, weekly kind of regimen, you need to increase that. Yeah. I'd love to have, I think for this one, I would love to let our panelists share some of their strategies real quick and what they do for outreach and networking. Cause I know that'd be really valuable to some of the attendees here. Yeah, I have, um, I would say this one too, the biggest thing I've learned in, especially in the copy accelerator community is that it's not just outreach to potential clients, but like networking with your community too, with your peers, with other writers. Um, because people like Marcus, Brian, like they're always looking out for you. And I've been tagged in, numerous posts across boards and groups that I wasn't even a part of, um, that have gotten me clients. And, um, so yes, the outreach to clients is super important. And I learned a lot about that early on, um, but networking with my peers and getting referrals that way has also been, um, a really, uh, great way, especially in this community. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, does anybody else want to share, um, their experiences from our panel? Yeah, I'd say um, when I when I initially was freelancing outside of my in-house job, I used to find like doing the numbers didn't work for me. It was more the quality. So I found like compared to like a lot of other freelan freelancers I know who were like hitting up 20, 30 people a day or jo joining loads of lists. I was just going in on like five at a time and like really getting to know what they do, what they're about and just finding different avenues to get through to them. So it, it was actually personalized. It wasn't like a copy and paste form of outreach that a lot of people do. It was like really um, personalized. Like I understand, maybe I've used the product. Um, you know, I'm aware of different things they're doing. And that really worked for me without having to do loads and loads of numbers. Rob, uh, Rob, you're dropping some good knowledge in the chat. <laughs> Come in with, uh, with what you're sharing. Yeah, so before I came into the fold here and got <clears throat> started associating with higher level copywriters. I was literally like reaching out to like local businesses, reaching out to folks online and like e-com that, that didn't hire copywriters. And I'm like wasting all my time pitching them on why they need to hire a copywriter. And finally I figured out that's the worst way to go about it. You just look for business that already employ copywriters and go from there. Um, Cause I see a lot of people make that same mistake that I did. So you can have a sample ready. Justin preaches this all the time. I've gotten a gig with BioTrust. I don't know how much, so like a $200 million company, right? You know how I got it? I wrote them a sample, I emailed it. The next day they're like, good move, here's the gig. So <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what I'd recommend doing. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important point, what Rob said. Uh, I always use the analogy, if you're selling a watch, do you want to sell the watch to the person who owns 12 watches already, or do you want to sell it to the person who's never bought a watch? You want to sell it to the guy who owns 12 watches already. Same thing with like, if you're selling a woman's shoes, she might have 40 pairs of shoes and think, oh, she, she doesn't need any more shoes. Well, she always needs more shoes. So uh, selling it to someone who already has a history of purchasing that is what you want to do and the exact same thing happens with the people who regularly write big checks for copywriters and hand out money to copywriters like it's nothing is the people you want to work with not the people 
like Rob said that, what's a copywriter? Oh, what are you going to do? Um, okay. Like how much do I need to pay you? Those are the worst clients. Cause even if you do convince them, they're gonna be an awful client. Uh, you're gonna have to fight them every single step of the way. They're going to wonder why you're using long copy instead of shorter copy. They're going to wonder why you're saying things this way instead of how they want. Like it's, it's just a nightmare. I mean, I, I've tried to do it with a bunch of nonprofit clients uh, simply because I wanted to help them. And it's the same thing as working with just a crappy for-profit client. Um, they just don't get it. So yeah, highly recommend. You need to be doing more outreach and you need to be doing more outreach to the right people. I, uh, I have two things. Um, so some of this comes down to knowing yourself too and how you, like your personality, right? So I thrive at going to live events. Like I love going to live events and I love talking to people um, and just building relationships. Like it's not like I go in with the idea of trying to turn somebody into a client. I go into these events just to make friends and make relationships. Um, and so, but that's me, right? Like I really enjoy talking to people and maybe live events aren't right for everyone and that's okay, but I love them and I thrive on them. So just know yourself, like if you are the type of person who can do cold outreach and email and send 30 emails a day, like, hey, if you're good at it, you probably can build an incredible book of business doing that. But I couldn't send a cold email for shit. Like it scares the hell out of me. I can't do it, but I can certainly walk into a room and talk to anybody. I love it. Uh, second thing. So I worked in house for natural health Sherpa. Like one of the things that you can do to build up your business is start with an in-house gig and allow yourself to build the skills and then share what you're learning, share your wins. And as time goes on, people start recognizing what you can do and what you've been learning and what you've been accomplishing. And then they come to you naturally because like, oh, hey, you're the guy that worked for Natural Health Sherpa. Can you write emails for me too? So you can leverage everything uh, to get more clients, but it's just about recognizing how to leverage what you're doing at any given time. That's a, yeah. that's a great point. For sure. Yeah, I think, I think that's a huge one. And, and one thing I've talked about, I talked about this in the freelancer freedom thing I did with Ian and it's in the course too, but like a sneaky strategy is kind of finding a hype man, right? Is what I call it. So, I mean, like when I, I talk about when Justin and I were launching Copy Accelerator, Justin had an email list and I didn't. So even though I was really well known in my, my kind of circle and with offer owners and people like that, there's a bunch of other people who didn't know who I was, but then suddenly Justin sang out all these emails, like Stefan Georgia is the greatest fucking copywriter ever. And suddenly all these people, not only were people joining Copy Accelerator, but they're like, you know, emailing me like, hey, I heard you're the best. Can I hire you? Right. And I got all these people were trying to hire me and pay me money. And I got a bunch of gigs from that. And then, I mean, like, you know, Krista, like I gave you a nice big shout out. And I would imagine that some people reached out to you after that. Um, you know, you do it by being good and crushing it and, you know, delivering on time and all that stuff. But um, the more you can find like a, a hype man or somebody or hype woman, right? Somebody out there who's sort of known in this space and who's an advocate for you, uh, the better. I mean, Chris Wright, who's a great copywriter, just gave this huge shout out to Peter Tezimus. I don't even know what's going on, but I would guess that Peter has been gaining a lot more business after that. I gave a shout out to Kate Vitaluch and her, like literally everything changed. So finding those people who you over deliver for them and then even asking them, hey man, can you, or hey lady or whatever, right? Can you give me a shout out? It's great if they do it organically, but you could always ask them, be afraid to ask because, you know, by the association of having somebody vouch for you is just, you know, massive. It, it could take you years to get what, what someone could do for you in a single post or, or um, shout out. And by the way, one more thing, everyone, please, please look in your chat down in the corner. It says two and it will say panelists or it will say panelists and attendees. There's a couple people, several actually, as I'm looking now, who just people keep doing panelists. And so no one else gets to see what you're sharing. And if I respond to you, then there's no context for everybody else. Please switch it to panelists and attendees. Svetsloff, Meredith, Kariski, um, Zarak, you've been doing it. I mean, I'm trying to call you people out, but like panelists and uh, Noah, Barbarak, you're doing it. Panelists and attendees. All right, I think this is the last one I have. Yep. So I wrote about this one in my email today. Basically your, your copy samples aren't making it easy for the client to say yes. So a couple, a couple ways this happens. You send over samples to a client who's hiring for a gig 
uh, or you're just cold outreaching to a client who you want to get hired from. Couple of reasons why you're gonna make it really hard on them. If your samples are not in the same niche as the potential client, you're making this more work for them. So I'll, I'll kind of tell you a story of this. Um, let's say you're in the, you write a lot of health copy and you're a decent health copywriter and I'm hiring for a biz op uh, job. If you send me over a health copy, I have to go read through all your health copy and then try to figure out on my own how well you're going to write for biz op type stuff. Um, that's a pretty hard thing to do for most business owners. Like I said, I can kind of do it because I look at copy all day, every day. I coach copywriters and I'm a very good copywriter myself. But your average business owner cannot do that. Even the ones running 20, 50, 100 million dollar companies. Uh, if you all you've ever written is financial stuff and you send them financial stuff and they're a health company, it's very hard for them to look at your financial stuff and figure out if you're gonna be good or not writing health copy. So a big, big, big thing is um, making sure that the samples you send are in the same niche that whatever they're hiring for. And like I said, the easiest way to do this is to simply write maybe like a lead or an email so that let's say if somebody in the dating niche wants to hire you and you're like, oh, here's this that I wrote. That type of thing you could get done in an hour or two uh, and then use it for all future kind of cold outreach type stuff in that niche. Uh, and if you do it for kind of like I said, the big niches, so you have health, you have finance, you have dating, survival, stuff like that. If you just have four examples for those niches, like that covers, I don't know, 80% of the gigs that are kind of offered out there, uh, especially if you add like make money online to that. So that, that pretty much covers all the big ones. So you don't have to write an entire sales page, but if you had an email or you had a lead that you could share with them, uh, you could do that. So like I said, your samples aren't making it easy for the client to say yes. Another pet peeve of mine, a lot of people when they email me, they'll link to samples instead of just putting them in an email. And if I'm going through 20 different or 50 different applications, which sometimes happens when somebody applies for a job, it's a real pain in the ass so it's a lot easier for me to just click the PDF that you have in the, in the email and open it up real quick and scan through it to see what your writing looks like instead of me clicking through and going to this portfolio page and then I have to click around in the port. Like it just throws me out of my entire rhythm. So like I said, you're making it harder on me and you're not making it easy for me to say yes. So I'm, I'm a big fan of always just putting a PDF uh, in your email when you're sending over samples, unless they specifically request something else. To me, that's, that's the easiest way to do it. Um, last one is, like I said, kind of ties in with what I said, the client has to try and decipher what your copy would sound like for their product. This is why Steph and I are big fans of having people actually write an email or write a lead for that specific person right away um, and say, hey, I wrote this for you, I, I saw your, I saw your greens offers doing really well and I've seen it advertised on a bunch of different email lists. Um, here's an idea I have for the lead. I wrote, I don't know, a quick two pages to give you an idea of what my writing would look like for your product. To me, that, that's super powerful because you're, you're going one step ahead of what everybody else does. Um, and I don't have to think. Like I said, I, I'm reading that. If I see it, I'm like, oh, damn, that's good. I'll just hire you right there because uh, you just made it super easy for me. So. Ties back in, like I said, your samples aren't making it easy for the client to say yes. This is a big mistake. You want to make it as easy as possible for them to say yes. Yeah, I've got more to say on that, but I can save it for, this kind of ties into one of my mistakes I'm going to go through. So um, I can save it for that. Let me jump in. I can, you want me, maybe I can share my screen? Yep, I'll stop the share. Hey, Stefan, can I just say something real quick yeah. about that last thing, about like pitching an idea to the client? Um, there's definitely a line with the bravado that you bring to the table when you're pitching an idea or saying like, Hey, I wrote something for free for you. Um, there's a certain humbleness that you have to have when you're doing that too. So, uh, like when I was at Sherpa, you know, me, Tanner, we would receive emails all the time of people who were like, Hey, I critiqued some of the Sherpa emails for you, giving my thoughts, like, you're free, feel free to test them if you want. And I get it. You know, you're trying to reach out and everything, but like 
we've tested everything to death and we know what's working and what's not working. So you coming in here and pretending like you're some expert to our email list is not going to get you a gig. You know, like be realistic about what you're doing instead of trying to, you know, instead of just trying to be like this big, like, hey, I know what I'm doing and I can help you make more money. Like, dude, we send to a million people. We know what we're doing. <laughs> we don't need you to come in here and tell us. Sorry, that's it. No, that's a good point. By the way, Justin, I need co host so I can share my screen. Um, yeah, Nick Daniel will send me screenshots sometimes because people will do that with V Shred Sculpt Nation. Where the, like, it's crazy some of the messages like, hey, I like, went through your funnel and it's okay. But um, you know, there's some things you guys aren't doing that I think could really be helping you out. But Nick's just like, oh, cool. Yeah, we did 250 million this year. Um, but thanks for letting me know that like we should be retargeting because we're totally not doing that. Just kidding. We are. You know I mean, it's like, it's just like, like, it's the same thing. It's just, you're kind of insulting the person when you come in there. And um, yeah, it's funny to see if people do that to you too. Um, but yeah. The not- funniest thing to me is when they reach out and they give you like, uh, you know, their samples and it's like half stolen copy from your own emails. <laughs> like they're literally stealing your first lines and everything. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've gotten emails that were literally my emails just kind of retweaked. <laughs> Yeah, dude, for sure. I, yeah, I think, I mean, because Mark Lamas, like he said, don't critique the big boys. Basically, yeah. Um, I think you can offer value. And be like, I love what you guys have. It's great. Um, you know, I had some cool ideas. I was maybe you want to test them and here they are. Like I've, I've gone and written like a creative for you. I wrote this lead or whatever. I'd love to, you know, to see you test it. So you can do it that way. And you're not saying, hey, your lead is shit. Like, you know, like I'm an expert on leads and your lead is not good. And then they're saying, they're like, oh, cool. We're doing $10 million a month with this specific lead. So, um, you know, thank you for letting me know that it's not good. Um, so yeah, it's more about just like a value add. Um, cool. Let me go ahead and share a couple of mine and these will be very, um, pitch specific, which will be kind of cool, hopefully. So this is like, um, I'm, I'm taking these examples. A lot of these are, are from copy accelerator stuff, like projects that we, um, have done. We, we've done some things for our, our light members where, We'll get an offer owner to put up, say, fifteen thousand dollars, and then we'll have ten members from Copy Accelerator Light, um, you know, write a letter for that client for fifteen hundred dollars each. Uh, sometimes it's been like thirty thousand dollars. I think Steve Gunn put up and whatever. So and they, but all the members were applying, and then and they apply to like myself and the client, and they kind of do an application process. So uh, it was actually gave me a lot of really gold, a gold to kind of to look at how our members were um, kind of pitching in their cover letters. And so one of the big mistakes I see here is like that you're not making, or that you're making your pitch about you and not the client. And I see this happening a lot. And saying I, I've, this is from a CA Light member and I gave her feedback on this. So that's why I'm sharing it. I'm not gonna share her name obviously, but this was for um, an offer for, I think this is for Ryan Saplin and one of his clients for our, our partners on a greens product. So I'm gonna read a little bit of it uh, to you not maybe not the whole thing maybe, maybe we'll skim a little bit but um right this is the cover letter help a stubborn lady to fund her wedding dress so initially i was thinking of listing out all the great reasons why i should be selected for this job reasons such as i'm the best at coming in second place in life so i've learned to work really hard because when you're number two you can't afford to slack off i could also talk about how i felt very tired lately as a result became more self health conscious which means running for a green drink would be something i'm naturally passionate about I could also flex my recent successes, such as writing for an eight-figure business and how I got that client because I continuously showed up every day. While all of them are kind of cool reasons, I decided to talk about something else, something even closer to my heart, and that is that this job would help me to pay for my wedding dress. I've already had a fitting. It's the most beautiful dress I've ever seen. I can already picture myself walking down the aisle. Anyway, from here, she kind of keeps going. Um, There'll be no wedding about this dress. Uh, I already paid for some of it. I need another $1,000. Uh, I'm not going to ask my parents for money. Um, you know, giving me this job means you can help this stubborn lady get her, her wedding dress. Um, and of course I would approach it with enthusiasm and passion and, you know, have a good work ethic and all that kind of stuff. So this cover letter is, is well-written actually, right? It, it's a nice, well-written cover letter, but think about it from this perspective and the, you know, for these gigs, like we're getting about 30 to 40 applicants and they're all saying cover letters and they're all in copy story light. Um, but it's like what I, I don't, you know, again, not just me, but as any client, like I don't really care about you and your wedding dress, right? I care about you helping me to sell a bunch of my product and reach people and to have success. And so 
Um, while, yeah, there's a little bit about her here and kind of like that, I could tell you about this cool stuff I've done. Uh, it really doesn't, I can't really picture working with you that much from this cover letter. And I, I do want to let the panelists contribute. I know the chat's going, I'm not looking at it, but I do want to show an example of a much better one. This is from Krista, who's one of our panelists, right? So Krista said, hello, Seth and Justin and Ryan. Krista and Sol here. This application really took me down a rabbit hole. I haven't found an exact niche that I prefer writing in, but I have discovered that a lot of clients I work with are writing to stressed out moms, overwhelmed parents, and women blaming their exhaustion on external factors, which is like totally the demo for this offer. So right there, it's like, oh, cool. She knows, you know, she recognizes that who the demo is. My research didn't start looking for an angle that could apply to this audience, but since Ryan and Yuri, Yuri's like the spokesperson and product creator, were looking for new approaches and ideas for this letter, I first looked through the ingredients and worked to find studies that confirmed the benefits of each one. The hormone balancing effects were intriguing to me as I dove deeper. I learned a lot about our body's reaction to stress and overproducing things like cortisol and adrenaline, which lead to overeating, sugar crashes, and systems in our body shutting down. I'm sure you're all familiar with a lot of this, but I thought it could be an interesting mechanism for the problem, and that's a great way to share the benefits of Yuri's energy greens for men and women. I'd love the opportunity to flesh out these ideas and build a sales letter using the RBC method plus a strong story is applicable to the 72% of moms that admit to being stressed about stress. Sorry, Stefan couldn't resist that one. I recently bought two unique products that have similar benefits. Firstly, because I struggled with some of these same issues. Secondly, because they had great copy and I want to see the entire funnel. And so I have some great research piled up on, for these pain points and how others have addressed them. I know this is a solid offer. It would be perfect project, a perfect project to sharpen my long form skills. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you again for this opportunity, Krista. So can you guys see like why Krista's cover letter is just significantly better than the first one. Um, it's like, first of all, like she's, she recognizes like the market. Then she's like, I started doing research, right? She's already doing research. She's already proactively working on it basically, right? In this case, I'm, I'm acting on behalf of the offer owner. So even me thinking this is a red, I'm like, wow, cool. She's already been researching it. She looked through the ingredients. She's found studies on this already. Like, oh, I bet she could write this pretty fast. Then she's actually talking about like mechanism ideas with like hormones and crashes. And I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah, like, like wow, Krista could, I can see how she could use this as a mechanism in the offer. Um, and then, you know, talking about the 72% of moms that are stressed about stress, again, I, she understands the market. Uh, and then even then making, then, then it's about herself, but in context to the product, right? Like I'm the market too, like, um, you know, on some level, like I bought the product, I bought products like this. I actually use them. I can talk about my experience with the products. Um, like I have research, I have pain points, I already have all this stuff. Um, you know, I know that I could do well. And again, Krista was very new at this point, but going back to what Sam talked about, because I, I, as a spoiler alert, one of my things is, um, I don't think pointing out your inexperience is a good idea. And I'll get to why that, that is in a minute, but she also wasn't like, I'm a pro who's just crushed it with a bunch of these letters. Right. But she's like, I understand the market. I'm already doing the work on it. This would be a great way to sharpen my skills. So she's kind of like, you know, indicating, hey, like I'm, you know, not the most seasoned copywriter, but like about, at this point, I don't even care really. Cause I'm like, yeah, yeah, fine. But like at the same time, you know, you seem like you really care about this project and know about it and I want to hire you. So um, there's a good contrast there. I'll, I'll stop and I don't know if there's anything in the chat to bring up or, or let our panelists chime in or anything like that. Yeah, I think probably the biggest success um, that I had was doing almost precisely this, where I showed that I had so much interest in writing for this offer. It was for like, Scott Phillips, where I spent like pretty much the entire week leading up to the point where he was going to make his decision, like, attending all of his online masterclasses, um, asking questions, participating in his Facebook community. So by the end of it, he said he hired me. He hadn't even read my samples. He just knew that I was the right person based on having put that time into it ahead of any decision. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And you've you've done a ton of stuff with Scott now. I mean, you like right from. Yeah, Scott. he's a good client, good friend, and yeah, he's put worked out really well. Amazing. Hey, um, Stefan, I yeah. um, I also just would like to encourage all of the newbies out there that. This looks nothing like my first outreach email. The subject line was like all caps, Santa, I know him. And like, I thought that pattern interrupts were the most important thing in outreach. And I learned very quickly that 
yes, you want to stand out, but for the right reasons. Um, and it is all about making it about them. Um, because the, the biggest wins I've had have been like a two minute loom video where I'm scrolling through their sales page or their email and saying, Hey, this part's great, but this is something I would tweak. I just think this will reach your, your prospects pain points or like something very specific where you you flatter them a little bit, but also give them some value. Um, so I do just want to encourage all of you that this, this took some coaching to get to this point because my first few were big flops, um, but you learn fast that way. So. Yeah, no, I think that's a great, great point. And, and hopefully the, for those who are on this call though, again, this, this helps them to, to shortcut that. Um, I'll show one more example. I'm definitely not going to do the whole, read this whole thing. It's super long. This is another person. This one was for, uh, I think for Steve Gunn for he did the same thing, like I mentioned. And this person started off kind of trying to talk about CoffeeZilla to, I guess, relate to me because, you know, CoffeeZilla did that YouTube video, right, about me. Um, but it's so, like, first of all, I'm like, that's not, like I'm helping Steve hire somebody. So like, yeah, this is like a thing that happened, but it's not already not particularly relevant. Um, and it's sort of like talking about CoffeeZilla, but, th but this is gonna be really meandering, right? Um, like the fellowship inside our closely knit group taught me very well how humans can be both sheepish and monstrous at times. And that's all right. Um, we're crazy animals clad in the most fancy piece of fabric with the same emotional hot buttons everyone else around us. Right, this copy is actually interesting copy here, right? But it's like, what does this have to do with Steve Gunn's sleep offer? Um, kind of just keeps pontificating. I realize men and women are different. Um, you know, you should move as possible and man reaches a certain degree. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck's going on in this one. And then basically, talks about something that I did for another person doing, having some success. And then it's like, um, you know, here's how obsessed I am. And it's talking about stuff that they do. It's like, great, man. Like, I'm like, like glad you, you're obsessed. But again, what is any, at the very end, it's like, I have a beef with Steve. I want to serve him a sizzling, sa savory chunks of honey glazed beef cradled in the golden platter of gratitude for the one time to give me tremendous feedback on the late I submitted for Andy Nilo's like on uh, ultra natural thing, which wasn't picked, but I'm rather all too thankful. So, you know, I'm all in, come take me, blah, blah, blah. So again, this might seem like, yeah, so this was a really weird one. I was hesitant about if I wanted to share it or not, but I do see this stuff a lot. People, they try to be funny and they tell this whole story and they, they're they like, they're, it's just all about themselves. But again, it's like, um, I think a good pitch and like a cover letter pitch, whatever, is really like writing a sales letter. It's like, Hey, I understand your, your, I've caught out your pain points. I understand them. Um, I can help you to solve those pain points. Like, here's what makes me unique. You're teasing your unique mechanism. Like, I really think if you look at like the, the pitch being almost like similar to sales, or you're calling out the prospects pain points and offering a solution, um, you know, like that's what your pitch should do. Uh, and then one more short one, this one's from Sam, Sam Novak for the same, uh, same offer for Steve Gunn. Hey there, Steve and Stefan. Super excited to be throwing my hat in the ring for an opportunity to work with you guys today, especially because story-driven copy that thrills my clients and pads their business bank accounts is my bread and butter. Well, I've been honing my story-driven copy craft first and foremost with emails and ads over the past few years, and I'm just now branching out into long-form sales letters. My story chops and dedication to seeing a job well done through to the end, uh, being on hand for any and all tweaks until the asset converts, not just if it does, did convince Tom Land to hire me to reboot a fatiguing weight loss and back pain offer that Jackster was too busy to write. I'm honored to be counted among Todd's trusted writers in the company of such an accomplished copywriter as Jack Steer. I would be honored to do the same for you. That end, I've included some headlines, big ideas, and two lead examples based on the original sales letter for this offer. I do know you only asked for one short start, start to a lead, but going above and beyond is something I pride myself on. Since it's clear that the current letter is full of gold, my strategy was to maintain the types of themes and stories that are proven to convert with the goal of making them more personal and emotionally impactful for the first per from the first person perspective. I'm super curious about and looking forward to hearing more about your personal story related to this product, Steve, uh, for the real deal though. Looking forward to working with you soon and stay safe uh, and well in the meantime, Sam. So Sam's is pretty short and like punchy here, right? But also, I mean, really the part that got me is like she, you know, is talking about the, what she does for clients. So there's a promise here. Um, the stuff of like uh, Todd Lamb and, and Jack Steer, like, you know, those are, they're successful people. Like there's some good credibility there. She's kind of name dropping, but in a, a subtle or humble way. Um, but then the biggest thing here is like, I include headlines, big ideas and two lead examples. So she actually over delivered 
on her um, proposal because I was like, hey, give me a short lead example and like a short headline example or two. But Sam went above and beyond. She provided you know, multiple headlines. She provided big ideas. She did two different leads, which was so smart, right? Because if I look at her first lead, uh, like sample or example, like I had her write it, right? Sample. Um, she, if I look at the first one, which I kind of, I think I remember one, liking one way more than the other one. So it was like the first one was like, eh, yeah, it's okay. But then the second one, I'm like, oh shit, like, yeah, that one could really work. So it was actually a really smart thing that Sam did. Somebody asked for, okay, hey, send over a sample email, send them two or three, a sample lead, two or three. Um, you know, like, I just think that uh, like, it, it just is super smart. And it's just like, like I talk about fascinations at the end of a lead of a sales letter, because if your big idea missed that there's these little hooks that maybe the fish swam, your, your fish swam by the, the big idea, but then they, they bit onto one of the fascinations, the curiosity bullets, it's the same thing with this. So um, I'll pause for a minute. I have obviously more stuff to share, but um, does anyone want to add anything from our panel? Yeah, I got something <clears throat> just real quick. Number one, um, business owners are very busy. So that last example of the bad letter, like just the length alone, I don't care what he wrote. doesn't matter. Most business owners are going to see that and be like, Oh, too long, gone. Keep it brief. Um, number two, uh, I don't really mess with cover letters, but I've been on a lot of phone calls and this is how I close a majority of them <clears throat> with money in my pocket. I just tell the client what I'm going to do for them, how I'm going to make them money. And I break it down. This is going to convert better because I'm going to blah, blah, blah. Start with the story lead. Your headline sucks. It's missing this. Blah, blah. Or don't say it sucks. Um, I'm just running at the mouth right now. Don't tell the client their copy sucks, but just tell them how you're going to help them and give them specific examples. And that's certainly worked for me. So just a, just a tip. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, anyone else for our panel want to share anything? Yeah, I actually do want to add, considering it was uh, my example. So I mentioned here that I got to write for Todd. And the story behind that, I think, is interesting and really ties into this um, because of the over-delivery aspect. So basically what happened was the first time I applied to work with Todd, I was really new. I had one sample that was related, and it was untested. And he was like, ah, I think I'm going to go with somebody else. I'm like, that's totally fine. But then like a week or two later, I was like, hey, you know, given everything on our call, I had already started doing some research. So here were a couple of big ideas that I had that might potentially be really interesting for your letter. I know at this point you might already have something going on, but these might make good uh, ad angles or something like that. And I shared my big idea and mechanism ideas with him. And then he got back to me like the next week and he was like, yeah, uh, do you want to write that letter? Because I'm not sure about the one that's that we just got. And I think I like those ideas. So do you want to do it? Do you have time to do it? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so like just over over delivering in every way and and like rob was saying or rob sorry tell them what you want to do like tell them what your ideas are because that's something that you know you can be a great copywriter but if you don't have good ideas then you're not gonna you're not gonna nail the letter right yeah it's awesome it's awesome Sam. um by the way justin what do you think as far as time goes because i know we're about an hour and i still have you know more stuff to go through but i know i want to be respectful of people's time yeah, I mean, I think we close these usually at 90 minutes. So we got about another, I don't know, 25 minutes. Okay, cool. Well, let me keep moving on then. Um, see, I think that uh, we'll, we'll have a little conversation on this one. Because one of my mistake number six for me is that you're pointing out your inexperience in your pitch because you're insecure. Um, I'll share my thoughts on it, but then we can talk. Maybe, maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Um, this is one for another one for one of the, the CA projects. I mean, well, let me read it and then we'll talk about it. Stefan, I apologize in advance for the sample you're about to read. I emphasize or empathize with the mind numbing mo monotony you're probably experiencing as you read through all of these entries. And I figured as someone new to the road of direct response, I don't have much of a shot against the full CA members. So I decided to have a little fun with Dr. Moreno's origin story. Well, I'm sure he would sell a lot more products, get booked on Ellen and have an HBO series dedicated to his life story if my version of events was true. I intentionally made that story a bit of a stretch, hoping that I might at least break up the tedium for you. Anyway, one of the perks of working with me is that I want to make your life easier. I totally take feedback and don't miss deadlines. My internet doesn't mysteriously go out. My computer doesn't suddenly crash. My dog never eats my copy. I developed these skills and systems over two decades, making a living as an agency brand copywriter, corporate communications guy, and PR hack. Uh, but I'm also brand new to the world of direct response copywriting, so I'm pliable. I'd love to continue to hone my chops and develop new ones working on Dr. Moreno's TSL. Cheers. Right? So there is good copy in here. I totally agree. But like this idea, first of all, like, just like, hey, I apologize for this. I know you're trying to be like self-defecating and stuff, but like it just reeks of, 
you know, no confidence. So like immediately I'm thinking like you're someone who's, who's messed up, right? Like it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, and then like, you know, as someone new to the road direct response, I don't have a shot. So like, if you're telling me you don't have a shot, like, why are you, then I'm thinking to myself, okay, yes, yeah, that's, that's a good point. I probably want, I shouldn't hire this person. Like you're sort of just like, you're, you're basically just qualifying yourself, you know, like, like, and you don't have any confidence. Why should I have confidence? Right. No, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm just laughing because I used a couple like dating examples earlier as analogies. Right. I feel like this is the exact, this is like literally the guy who is just apologizing because like the girl he's talking to is like way up here and he's down here and just, it's just an awful start. It really is. It's brutal and it sucks because again, this person actually had some nice stuff down here. And in, frankly, I think a big thing to look at, right? Two decades as an agency brand copywriter, corporate communicate. I would have led with this, right? Like if you're talking about like, um, you know, I mean, I'd be like, hey, oh, I'm so excited to apply for this. I looked through it. I love it. Here's what I love about the opportunity, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, and just reading this and relating to it, I know I can crush it. Um, because even though I'm, you know, new to the road of copywriting, of direct response, um, I've worked with similar clients in the past during my 20 plus years as an agency brand copywriter, corporate communications guy, and PR hack, um, you know, and like, I can't wait to, to hone my chops and by helping Dr. Moreno, you know? So it's like, you, this is like leverage the shit out of this from my perspective, because like, then you have credibility immediately. Um, the other thing too, though, I mean, this is a little thing. It's not related to the mistake exactly, but this idea of like, um, like, so I decided to just make a bunch of shit about the client. It's like, or they and like the offer. Like to me, that's just a really poor decision as well because, like, this is for like a compliant offer of like a real spokesperson, right? So it's like you know, instead of that, you kind of like made a bunch of stuff. So how how does that? If I'm supposed to like envision, you want me to envision working with you and what it looks like. And you want you know, I can't. So the only thing I can envision now is like, if like you know you're gonna make a bunch of shit, or that like, like I, how do I like I I'm, I don't know I don't know what that does. How does that help me if you're just like using give me a bunch of copy that we both know can't actually be used, right? Like that just is not helpful at all. Um, so that's I me. Mean, that's a, a tough example. Here's I think I have one more bad one and two good ones. So. Um, Hey, Stefan. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Yuri. Very excited about this project. The opportunity to write part A and direct response without sacrificing personal branding is going to be an interesting challenge. I'm ready to take it on. So here's a bit about me. I've had prior experience in the high ticket biz up space. My email copy has generated about 2 million in the attributable revenue and all of my funnel copy has contributed another few million to my clients. So on some level, my copy works. Right now I'm looking to get better at writing long form copy and I want to work with respectable brands and get a few big wins under my belt with a larger audience. As I'm reading Yuri's book, I'm digging that this is a purpose-driven brand and not just for pure profits. So for me, this seems like a perfect fit. And I've got a bachelor's in kinesiology. So digging through scientific journals will be familiar with all painful experience. And I was looking forward to hearing back. I actually think this one's not that bad. It could have been like medium. It was probably more fair. Um, like, you know, okay. Like they're excited about the challenge. They're ready to take it on. Um, I, I just don't love the, 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 on some level, my copy works. It's just like, again, that lack of confidence to me, um, is bizarre. It's like, this is cool. I'm like, oh shit, you're legit. You must know what you're doing. You're good. And it's like, on some level it works. And like, oh, and it's like, I'm looking to get better at writing long form copy, right? To me, it's like, I don't, again, I'm not hiring you so you can get better. I'm hiring you so that you can do a good job and, and get a win for the client. So it's like, if you want to say, I guess back to Sam's point, like, I'm okay with you saying like, but you know, and I'm, I'm looking, I'm continuously honing my chops and like, you know, I'm, I'm excited to like to flex my muscles with this offer, um, you know, as I continue to progress in the role of direct response copy. I think stuff like that makes sense. But this idea of like, oh, I'm looking to get better. So hire me so I can practice. Like, how is that an alluring value proposition, you know? Um, so you don't have to be cocky, but it just seems like those are my two issues with this one. Um, and they're kind of right back to back in this. I think that can, that can really hurt your proposal. Um, God, I guess I have three bad examples. Let me show this one. Let's see. Um, I mean, this is just another one where it's like, I'm, you know, I've been writing copy since February of this year. Uh, it might not be a long time in comparison to others, but because I'm new to the game, I have a lot of drive. I just, I don't think this is necessary. Again, 
to like to the point being like if you want to you know so if the client asks you like how long have you been writing copy for then like sure you can tell them oh, i'm pretty new but i've been studying a ton i'm writing a lot blah 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 but like why you don't need to lead your your pitch or your letter to someone with like hey i'm brand new and not that experience it's just like why like why like i don't i just for me i just don't think there's any reason it's you're you're self-conscious you're a little bit you know kind of paranoid or afraid of not getting hired or whatever and so you're sort of trying to preemptively answer this objection right um but like it just to me I, I just think it's a mistake so i really think for a lot of the newer freelancers you just don't need to overshare and be like hey i have no experience anyway like there's no point like you don't have to say that you know you can mention i'm you know i'm improving and all that kind of stuff yeah cody griffin said what they don't know doesn't hurt them unless they ask for that info. And that's sort of the way I look at it. Um, and then when we show, I want—I figured this would be fun to show. This is, um, you won't be able to read this very well, but I'll read it out loud. Um, this is like my, the first gig I ever got on Elance from 2012. Um, and it's not even like amazing, but I just want to point something out. So the posting said, I need a talented copywriter who can rework my existing sales letter to improve the conversion rate. I don't want the letter to be too long, 1,000 words or less. I just need it to be more persuasive without being too hard sell. Open to different styles and approaches, looking for something effective, convincing and converts well. And so I had the screenshot, but yeah, this is from like, oh yeah, June 10th, 2012. And so here's my actual like proposal. I, I copy and pasted it out so it's better. And again, this isn't like a killer proposal. Now you can see, by the way, I talk about charging 149 for a sales letter. I charged $97 for the sales letter. So just keeping it real. But I was like, hello, I can happily re rework your existing sales letter so that it's more compelling. My letters offer excellent benefit features explanations, which I know what the fuck that means, but, and relate well to my audiences. I always crush the industry average on conversions and work quickly and with precision. I'm attaching several samples of recent copy that I've written. I usually do write over 1000 words, but I can keep it to this requirement, uh, requirement length while still dramatically improving it. I can also adjust tone as desired. I generally charge well upwards of $300 per sales letter because I'm new to Elance and don't have much of a track record here yet. I'll take on this task for only $97 plus whatever Elance tax on. They'll be getting a highly professional and experienced copywriter who put a space between copy and writer and world class level content. Thank you. And I look forward to your reply. Stefan George, I, PS, I have extensive research, uh, references available if you'd like them. So basically, point here being like, is this like, you know, I mean, it's not like the greatest pitch or application ever, but I'd written like two or three things on Warrior Forum, but it wasn't like I got this job and this guy ended up hiring me for a couple other letters and paying me like, you know, 297, 397 stuff like that. And like, I no place in my like, Hey, I'm brand new. My girlfriend told me about copywriting like two months ago. And it's pretty nifty. So I don't know what, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing, but um, you want to hire me? I was just like, you know, I just made up shit like, ah, excellent, you know, benefit feature explanations. Cause I know we're all looking for great benefit feature explanations. Um, you know, but I'm like, I crushed the industry average on conversions. It's like, well, that's kind of true. I, did, I wrote one letter for on warrior form and it did crush the average. So it wasn't a full on lie um you know and i shared some samples and stuff like that but like i just thought it'd be fun to look at that because again this is this is 2012 stuff and like i've literally been copywriting for like two or three months um but there's no point in my like i'm a total beginner i'm just like hey i'm confident i can crush this um so i thought that'd be fun to share so i'll go back to like, i have one more mistake and then just a quick bonus is one um i don't i don't think you should offer up references no i wouldn't do that um, I was, again, this is me not knowing what the fuck I was doing. Um, but no, I don't think you should offer references. Um, yeah, I think if somebody asks for them, then fine. But like, there's no reason to do it. Panelists, do you guys want to add anything before I go to the last mistake? I just wanted to clarify that I agree with you. Um, if for me, it's just a line when somebody asks you and then you try to hype up like small stuff you've done or like basically misattribute it. Like, so you wrote samples and sent them to a big name and then you're like, yeah, I wrote, I wrote copy for a big name. And you're like, no, you didn't, <laughs> right? So I, I just don't trump yourself up in that way because it's going to bite you in the, it's going to bite you in the butt, but definitely be confident and, and talk yourself up. If you don't believe in yourself, why would they? Yeah, strongly agree, Sam. I totally agree. And I've, I've seen that. I've seen people get called out on it because they try to, say they've written for people they haven't. And, in, and even the clients, if you submit samples to like, this happened with, with to use Vshred again, uh, to Vshred and somebody like, um, and like basically sent them samples or wrote, like there was some email on spec and it did terrible. And then the person was like, you know, I've written for Vshred, blah, blah. And then and like Nick Daniel just like was messaging them. Like, like I, you do not want to be that person. Like he, he sent me the screenshots and it was like, that person probably was shitting themselves because Nick was just so furious about it. Um, so it's just not worth doing that. 
And um, Sam, no. I want to I want to emphasize something Sam said in the chat too. Before is you don't need to leverage like or talk about your inexperience, but you can definitely leverage like your resources, like the fact that you're getting, especially in in copy, et cetera, light, or even in Justin and Stefan talk copy, like that you're getting feedback. You're you're posting it for peer review. You're um, whatever you promise. Just work hard to get to that point. I have written things for things I have no idea about. And it's all about just doing the research and doing the work to get there. Cause you have resources everywhere to get to that point. That's great point, Krista. Uh, all right. Uh, this one is very close to home to me because again, my first like bigger client that changed everything for me came because I leveraged my I'm new, but I'm hungry. So kind of like how you can take a big idea and you can go multiple ways with that big idea. Like you can take your newness and you can be negative about it. Like, oh, you're probably not going to pick me because I'm new, but you know, whatever. Or you can be like, hey, look, I'm fucking new, but I'm really hungry. I'm really hungry. I'm going to come in. I'm going to bust my ass to do good for you. Um, and that's, that's how I got my first gig. And that client ended up hiring me for eight sales letters in a year. And it was all because of this like thousand word email that I wrote that I basically just said, hey, I'm new and I'm hungry. Um, and yeah, there was like more than that, but you can leverage it. You just have to leverage it right. Did so you, I just don't, I want to stay away from the blanket. Like it's never good. Did you, that's fair, Jared. But did, did you, I'm curious, did you share any, when you apply, did you share any kind of custom samples with them or was it just like a, a email with no samples? Uh... I believe, yes. Okay. So I had written one sales letter prior and I had written some emails for like the launch of that sales letter. So I attached that, but that was the only thing that I really had at that point. Cool. Got you. Yeah. I so think, I think it, all, it also comes down to what client you're talking to, obviously. Again, not every client wants somebody new, but some clients do want somebody new because they want to try and find that needle in the haystack of like, Hey, I can pay them a little bit of money, train them up. They're going to come in and write copy that I know is good, that I know is going to work for my business. And, you know, it's an investment for them. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think it's totally fair, Jared. Can I um, piggyback on that just real quick? Like that was what Jared just said is super, super, super key, I think. Because I was able to leverage my copywriting coaches to get gigs for mid-level to lower level clients just to get my reps in, right? You got to get your reps. <clears throat> now I would not go to natural health Sherpa and be like, Hey, I have a coach and a brand new, isn't that great? But to the right client, you can pitch that and be like, you're paying me this. Meanwhile, I have two A-listers reviewing my copy. And in my case, that actually worked, but it has to be the right client, right? Like some, the bigger clients don't want to deal with that. Like, well, well, then why wouldn't I just hire your coach? So always keep in mind who you're talking to, who your audience is. Yeah, that's good. That's a good point as well. Um, cool, I'm gonna jump into this last mistake, um, which is that you're not providing custom samples during your pitch. We've kind of touched on this a bit here. Um, to me, this is like every single time you should be applying or uh, providing custom samples. So we talk about when you reach out to somebody with like, hey, I wrote three emails for you, right? That type of thing. But even if it's like, hey, looking for writers and blah, 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 and you're applying amongst other people, um, custom samples win. So for the example I have here is um, for a Dr. Saladino, who's like the you know um, author of the Carnivore Code and kind of like one of the big names in the Carnivore Diet. And Justin and I got to spend four days with him at a, at a mastermind a few weeks back. Um, and you know, we we're talking about his emails because I bought his products. I think Justin has as well. And he's emailing like once a week. And we're like, dude, you got to email like every day. And we were like, it was funny. Honestly, it was like, Justin and I just sat there. It was like early morning. And for like an hour, we were just like giving him all this marketing advice. And he's like taking down notes. And you know, he's like, all right, cool. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to start emailing every day. So then I was like, hey, I'll help you find a writer and copy. Sorry. So I posted a thing and some of our members applied um, to be able to write for them. And so I'll show you the good one first. This is from uh, Dr. Molly Levitt, who was on the call earlier. I'm not sure if he still is or not. And she's the one who got uh, selected. So I'm gonna go through the cover letter kind of real quick, but then I'll show you what she did with it, right? So thank you for the opportunity to participate in the submission for Dr. Saladino. 
Here's why I've submitted. I love this topic. As soon as Stefan mentioned the carnivore code, I purchased the book and read it straight through. I was impressed with the science and the thorough research in the book. I've been following Dr. Saladino for a bit now, receiving emails and following him on Instagram. I'm also taking Heart of the Warrior, which is one of his supplements. I would have ordered more supplements, but he was out of stock of the ones I wanted at the time. I've known about the Weston Price Foundation for a few decades and was encouraged when Dr. Saladino mentioned Dr. Price. I'm familiar with some of what Dr. Saladino discusses. I purchased Sally Fallon's book, Nourishing Traditions, based on the work of Weston Price. I use the recipes when raising my children, so I have long had a personal interest in the best diet uh, for human health and longevity. I love Dr. Saladino's mission of serving the public and reversing, eliminating, and annihilating disease. So many people who are so sick, especially children, it's just nuts, and it will take a radical personality to undo the damage and get everyone on the right path. My approach with the emails would be to both simplify and increase the number of emails. Dr. Saladino is a really smart guy with a wonderful personality and has marvelous content in his emails. He's enthusiastic and fun, but sometimes his emails have so much information that are too long and complex for the average person. There's so much valuable information that would hate for the reader to miss anything. I'd also start with a consistent format so that his tribe knows what to expect inside the emails. People love the familiar. Um, one of his top competitors, but also a friend I believe, Ancestral Supplements, has more followers on Facebook and Instagram than Dr. Saladino, so I would also be up for a copy to drive more engagement. In addition, the owner of Ancestral Supplements has a personal touch, answers every email properly, and also has a few other tricks up his sleeve that Dr. Saladino may be interested in. Thank you for your consideration. Needless to say, I'd be thrilled to not only rate emails, um, but also see where all this leads. Uh, got that part of warrior feeling, of warrior feeling. Best uh, of success to Dr. Saladino. I'm grateful for his work, Molly. So, I mean, Molly just like crushed it. And yeah, she did just start writing copy when she, she joined Copy Accelerator. She was like a, a chiropractor and, and an entrepreneur and enjoying having a starter at the September event and um, just crushed it, right? It's like she'd read the book. Um, she bought the supplements. She's talking about what she likes. She, uh, this is all stuff that Dr. Saladino talks about. Um, she loves his mission. She like personally lives his mission. And then she basically does give you like a, a little bit of like a criticism, right? But it's not like a, um, like, Dr. Saladino's emails suck and could be better. You know, it's like, he's such a smart guy, wonderful personality, enthusiastic and fun, but sometimes his emails have, which by the way, what was so funny, this part too, of, you know, they're too long and complex, is that um, Paul Saladino had been talking to Justin and I like that morning and literally was like talking about how he's like, I feel like sometimes I put too many links and I have too many things going on. And maybe there's too like, he literally was already like thinking about this stuff, right? So she, like, he basically just like like reflected what was already in his mind, a pain point he already had, and was like, she was perceptive and pointed it out. So his cover letter is incredible. And then she basically attached, um, and I, you know, I'm not as much of a stickler on the attachment versus putting the sample in the email as Justin is. I, I totally respect his opinion on it. I just don't, whatever, it's not to me as big of a deal. But she attached two emails. So like, Ronnie goes, coffee doesn't love you back for real. And she basically wrote this whole email. It's talking about something bad in coffee. Um, and, you know, basically this goes through, and, and this is a really cool email, looked at her on soil, she's been linking stuff, uh, you know, feedback for her was maybe not to do so many links to different products, but it's like, this email was very good, it was mostly in Paul's voice, when he read it, he was like, oh my god, like, yeah, this feels like something I would write, um, and then here's like another one, right, um, are you low on riboflavin, and just sort of like, she wrote this cool email, and it was like good, and linked to stuff, and was just totally like, so, it's like, do you know how easy it is to choose Molly? Um, because it's like, you're looking and she, like, she understands him. She, she bought the book, she bought the supplements and then she's giving emails that are like pretty much plug and play. So Paul knows he can hire her and by like the start of next week, which I think she started ready, her emails started going live. I think either this week or last week, I think it was last week. I'm not sure Molly, you're, I can't see if she's in the chat or not, but um, like, you know, this is like plug and play. And then I think I'm pretty sure Paul was like, hey, can you help me with social media? Can you help me with this? Now Paul is hiring you for more stuff on top of this, by the way, too, which is like just killer, right? Um, here's another one real quickly that was good, but not the winner. So why was it good, but not the winner? Yeah, you beat me to it. The truth was I was going to message you about how to get in contact with Dr. Sal, you know, because the car work code is a life-changing one offer. Here are a few things that really intrigued me. Um, and they share stuff. So this one's also customized. Um, talking about game changers in the book, the tone of the voice, um, enjoyed the book, really want to work with this person. Um, and, and but then I've attached, I'm attaching a sales letter for a sleep supplement as well as an email sequence that I wrote for Bob Diamond. I think you're at, you'll act, uh, you've actually seen this before, but since we're talking about health and email, I thought these would be the best examples to share. So there's like a sales letter for a sleep offer. And then there's this, uh, 
Bob Diamond, who that is. So, so I'm not sure the person who wrote this is on the call. I don't think they are, but um, their cover letter was pretty good. But it, it, and maybe the samples are, are, are decent too. But think about it. If I, in between this person and then Molly, who not only had to kill a cover letter, but gave me plug and play emails, um, it's going to be Molly every time, you know? So that's why I just like, the, the kind of doing custom creatives is really important. So I do want to, I would do want to kind of start to wrap up here and then I just have a few quick things to share after that. Um, I just want to mention again, following up is so important. Um, this is Molly, by the way, related to this for, she wrote a greens letter as well that wasn't selected as the winner for, um, for Ryan Saplin. These are just emails for her to me, but it's like, she asked for feedback in this email thread. Uh, she forwarded me something. She asked me multiple times here. I wrote something else and she asked me again. Then she asked me again and then here. So basically Molly wrote something that wasn't even the winner for, for another project. She followed with me probably seven or eight times to give her feedback. I did give her feedback. Um, but not only did that, was that good that she followed up, but then when she applied for the Saladino thing and I'm like, man, I know Molly really wants it, right? Like, you know, she's like, I'm, I'm just, Molly's on my brain all the time. Like I actually need to follow, she, she has, she's asked me a question recently that she followed up on that I need to get back to her on. So, you know, following up is really good. Uh, another example, I'm not, actually I'll show this super duper duper fast. This is Nick Verge for Freelancer Freedom. I said, hey, we might want to write, have you write a letter for us. I want you guys to see this. Nick, Nick, with the 16th, 17th, 19th, 20th, me, I appreciate the follow-ups. Uh, I need you know, to wait on the end. Okay, great. 21st, 23rd. 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, blah, blah, Ian, finally on the, on the third. So sorry for not seeing your emails. Um, just saw all these in the inbox. I'm gonna read through them, give you a proper response. You know, feel free to shoot me a text. I want you guys to see Ian's number, which was just on there. Um, you know, anyway, awesome. Sounds good, mate, blah, blah, blah. And then we ended up hiring him and paying him to write a sales letter. Um, that's extreme. But like, it didn't bother me that they followed up like 20 times and eventually we actually hired him and paid him several thousand dollars. Um, so following up. And the other one is just being personalized. I'm not gonna go through this whole little bonus example right now, but obviously don't send generic like cover letters and generic stuff like personalize your, your pitches. Um, so for everybody on the call, let's, uh, I'd be curious to know what was kind of your biggest takeaway so far. We're gonna do a little recap here um feel free to pop it in the chat what's one thing that you learned on the call that you might have already been doing or uh it was a mistake you're already making pop it feel free to pop it in the chat so may ask how many times to follow it depends at least every couple of days at least every two or three days to follow so custom samples it's okay to follow up the fortune of the follow up having samples ready uh, follow up more reaching out to clients who are already hiring copywriters don't come across as self deprecating more confident in the emails be specific on what you can offer to a client yep do better more outreach yep Writing custom samples, yep, that's a huge one. Cool. So sounds like you guys got a lot out of this. Um, so Steph, <clears throat> Steph and I real quick just want to tell you about the upcoming Copy Accelerator event. If you haven't bought a ticket yet, uh, all of the copywriters that are on the panel that are hanging out will, will be there. So you get to mingle with them and learn from them as well. Um, the event is, Stephanie, you want to pull up the, uh, the sales page, we can go over it real quick. Oh, I just put the link to into the chat for how you can apply to attend the event. But yeah, do you want to talk or you want me to um, go over yeah, it? Go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, really, if you haven't applied yet for the event, um, I think we have right 110 applicants and I think like 75, or no, 80 people have bought tickets now. Um, but basically this is for our, our mastermind is Copy Accelerator. It's um, like, about $15,000 a year to be in the light version of it and $40,000 a year to be in the full. Uh, part of the membership is that you get, you know, access to two events per year. Uh, and Justin and I, since the beginning, have decided, you know, let's also sell tickets to the event so that people who are in the mastermind are able to come in and experience everything. So, um, you know, 
we have an incredible panel of speakers. I'll talk about that kind of stuff in a second. But beyond that, for all of you freelancers who are on this call, this is really your opportunity to go in and to, to build that network and meet those clients and those potential dream clients. And also to, to build a network with other copywriters who can send you referrals, right? Um, it all happens at this event. So it's virtual, um, but we did virtual the last one in September as well. And we it was insane. Like, I, I don't know what, probably 30 people got gigs from it, 40 people, um, but also people just built relationships. It, like, if you like the value of what we just shared today, that's the, imagine just talks like that, like all day long from Justin, myself and other experts. And, and on, you know, we obviously, we share them on freelance. We actually have like, like networking sessions, like where you go, all the offer owners who want to um, hire copywriters are at tables, these virtual tables, and you can go jump around from table to table and talk to them and get in FaceTime and get to know them, get their contact information. But we're also doing parties. Like we have a virtual cocktail party, like a virtual kind of um, final night party. Uh, there's just a ton of camaraderie and a ton of relationships that get built and you get that face time and it's one of the best ways to then get opportunities to write for clients regardless of if you are very early on or you're a seasoned vet or seasoned pro uh and then we have killer content on all things that will up level you because remember you have to be and you know you need to keep getting better and better to get better clients the better you are the more your skills higher skill set the better kind of clients you can land and they pay more and they're the more fun to work with and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, you know, we've got trainings on how to beat controls that, um, you know, are stuck or, or you know, how to get letters that aren't working and make them to winners. Uh, talking about how to increase the average order value, which if you do that for a client, uh, that can be a huge win. Uh, like a, a very quick anecdotal example for myself, somebody messaged me yesterday, obviously I can charge more, but they have like a lead that they want to be beat. And I was like, all right, hey, I'll help you. I'll, I'll write you a new lead. And for every percentage point that, um, you know, it, it improves by, you'll pay me $1,500. So if I can get you a 30% boost, you pay me $45,000. And the guy was like, okay, great, right? Um, but the kind of stuff that you need to know in order to like actually, you know, beat controls and beat leads, like that's the kind of stuff we share. Like I can just go into the resources we have and, and the speakers where we have this event and you learn things that you can then apply to working with clients. Um, so yeah, beyond that- uh... One thing I think would be really smart, let's have some of the copy panelists just give like a one or two minute, um, I don't know, review or insight into what the last event was like for you and kind of what it's been like in general for you. Who wants to go first or is it going to be me? <laughs> yeah, now that you talk soon. Well, nobody was going. All right. So the, what I was saying and what I was saying in the chat and that I really wanted to highlight is that basically if you thought today's call was like full of actionable value and was going to change the way that you freelance and the kind of clients that you can get and all that kind of stuff, then going to the event is like that. Like every single talk is like this, but 10 times over. It's all like hyper targeted, super actionable stuff that you just take away and implement. Even if you take away just one thing, it can basically make or break an entire career for people. Business owners come, they learn one small tweak, their business explodes the next year. Copywriters come, they learn one small tactic for outreach, their business explodes the next year. Or they join the group and all of a sudden their network explodes and everything changes for them, right? So it's just that sort of thing where if you thought that this was really good, then what you're going to get at the event is like this, like times 10 or times 100. And, and I know that sounds kind of like hypey and silly, but I can say that because I've been to them before and I've been a member of Copy Accelerator now uh, intermittently. I was in full last March and then I, I joined rejoined uh, via light in September and it's changed everything for me. So it's well worth at least test driving it at the event to see what you So I'm a, as I stated earlier, I'm a live events person and I love them. And so last time when it was, announced that it was going to be virtual, I was very, very skeptical, um, like really skeptical. And it absolutely blew my expectations out of the water. It was so good. Even with like the first day of like trying to get over the hiccups that, you know, they naturally have with audio, video, whatever. Um, the way that they schedule like the, the round table and the networking and everything is so incredibly good. And on a software that was brand new, but like amazing. And it allows you to have as real of a feel, like a real, as real in life or, you know, in-person event feel as you can virtually. And so I, I just want to, you know, make sure to point that out because some people will not go because it's not live. Um, and that's, that, that should be a mistake. Like that is a mistake. Go to this because it, 
they do a really amazing job of making it feel very personal. And you're at these tables with, you know, a handful of other people and you're still getting to learn and uh, get to know great people and get to know business owners. And uh, yeah, that's, it's incredible. So just go. Awesome. One of the biggest questions I hear from newer copywriters is where do I find good clients? Well, the answer is events like this. Remember when I just said earlier, you don't go to Bob's muffler shop in your hometown, which is not going to hire a copywriter. Everyone at this event hires copywriters. And the fact that you spent the money to invest in yourself, to put yourself in this position, is going to make you stand out above 99% of the other copywriters that aren't willing to invest in themselves and aren't willing to man or woman up and go to an event. So if you want to stand out, it's a good way to do it. And there's tons of clients. Um, at the last virtual event, you go to these little air table things, right? And I'm sitting there with <clears throat> seven, eight, nine figure business owners, just chatting with them. Like we're at, a, we're at a bar, like, so you do get that feel as much as you can, even though it's virtual. Um, the clients are still there, they're still waiting to hire. So go. Appreciate that. Anyone else want to share from our panel? Yeah, I'll, yeah. Uh, Man, if, I'll say something yeah, from think. like the uh, the woo woo energy side of things. Like when you attend an event like this, and kind of to Rob's point, like even if it's virtual, you're bumping shoulders with people that are making five times as amount of money as you, or people running eight figure businesses. Like you automatically just level up. It shifts your possibility for what's possible. And it just shows you that like the people in this room right now, yeah, it's virtual, but they're your peers. And like, you've probably seen interviews of some of them before. Like if a guy like me can do it, then a person like you can do it. And a lot of it just comes down to putting yourself in the right environment. And it's the best environment I've ever been a part of. And it's all been virtual so far. So totally amazing experience. That's a, that's a big point I, I want to expand on real quick. Um, Stefan, we don't really talk about that enough, but the number of copywriters who come in to one of the events thinking, if I could just make like two or three K a month, I'd be really happy. And then they meet a bunch of people who are making 10, 15, 20, 50 K a month. And their entire concept of what was possible completely shifts. Um, they come out thinking, okay, I, I, I could be charging 5k for a sales letter. I could be charging 15k for a sales letter. Um, the 2k or 3k the idea that I had in my head was peanuts compared to what I actually could be doing. So I'm glad you brought that up, Cody, because it, it is a huge benefit that we don't really talk about enough. Uh, simply being in the room with people that are doing that much better than you that are making making a whole lot more money a whole lot easier. Uh, it completely changes the way you think and what you think is possible for yourself. I think Heidi, you had something to share as well, right? Yeah, um, I was actually in that exact ex experience that Justin just described. Like I have been struggling as a copywriter for almost two years at that point when I went to the last um, live event and I snuck in at the last minute as a volunteer. Like I didn't even have money to go, but I replaced somebody. So I got to work on the team and uh, I discovered like exactly what I was missing. Like I knew I was missing something. And I didn't discover what it was until I found this group and this community. Um, because like to Justin's point, I had no idea. I, like I knew I could charge so much more, but I just had no idea how to get there. I didn't know how to get in front of those people. I wasn't really finding them on my own. I didn't really have other copywriters I could compare stories with and ask about pricing and how they landed clients and all that stuff. So it's just been a game changer for me since getting into this group. And it made me immediately join Copy Accelerator Lite because I was like, this is what I need. This is what I've been missing. I don't want to lose it. Let's keep this going. And um, also like I immediately made my money back after joining Copy Accelerator because I landed two gigs. So it does pay for itself. You just have to use the resources and put in the work and you'll be supported by awesome people. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Heidi. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and in the chat, I know so many cool things coming in the chat too. Um, and Brian mentioned, right, one client could pay for the event 10 times over. 
uh, Matt Murphy. I went in September, didn't know DR from poetry, and now I make a living in DR. It's true, Matt. And you're like getting booked up and stuff. We were talking. You're like, ah, I've got another retainer client trying to like knock down my door. Like, I'm not, you know, like, look, does it happen overnight that magically, like, you know, you you are gonna just have every client in the world, you know, banging down your door? No, no. But like, you, there's a good chance you can get a client no matter what. Like, and you start to to make those relationships that over the the months to come after the event, there's like a long tail effect. There's a good chance of you getting an ROI at the event, but then you're also developing relationships where over the next couple of months, like more and more opportunities start to come your way. And it's, that's a really cool thing to see as well. Yeah, uh, Grant one, one thing, one thing I want to add stuff in, um, like I said, I've used a bunch of uh, dating analogies. I think there's another good one here. So you just kind of cold emailing someone who doesn't know you has never heard of you and trying to get a gig that way. It, it can work. Uh, a lot of people on this call have made it work. It's a lot harder than if the person has heard of you or has known you. Like I said, it's kind of like dating, like you walking up to a random person in a bar and trying to talk to them is a whole lot harder than you being at a dinner party and your friend introducing you. Uh, it's two completely different situations. The power dynamics are very different. The exact same thing happens with clients. Um, if you meet someone at one of our events, even if you're not ready to work with them yet, um, you're getting in early and getting them to know you uh, for what could become a future kind of gig down the road. Or when you're emailing people that you met at the event later, it's like, hey, I'm Chris. I was at the Copy Accelerator event, blah, blah, blah. That puts you in a different category already compared to random Joe who they've never heard of uh, emailing them out of the blue. So that's definitely a big benefit as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, um, Justin. I mean, and a couple people are asking, you know, what's like the, the deadline to um, apply? I mean, I don't know if we have a hard one. We'll probably, you know, give it a few more days here. But um, but really, like to what Brian mentioned, like the, the faster you sign up, the better. Because again, like, not only like when you join, you get to be inside the Copy Accelerator Mastermind leading up to the event. And that includes four training calls, you know, per week. Yeah, I will, I will show inside CA real quick. So um, basically, in addition, we have a weekly training call that Justin and I do. So next one will be next Tuesday. But then you also get two feedback calls or Saba, uh, Karimi, and uh, Mike Abramoff, where you, they'll submit copy, or you can submit copy and get feedback at, and critiques on your actual copy. So if you feel lost or stuck or you know what to do, you actually get feedback. Um, and then you get a weekly uh, freelancing call, business freelancing call with Brian Spernello, who's been in the chat. Um, and Brian, uh, I think he's doing one today. Aren't you doing like one right now, Brian, basically? Um, we'll do another one next week. It's all about how to actually, uh, you know, he's talking about switching out how to get clients at the event. You just finished it. Well, good news, because if you like check this out. So again, this is the letter. We have like all these amazing speakers like John Benson, Steve Gunn, who's doing a thousand plus sales a day in CBD. Um, Henry uh, Bingaman, who's like a financial copy wizard. Uh, Carlene Ingley Cole, who's an incredible copywriter. Uh, Pauline Longden, like Justin and I, obviously. So I don't even want to bear it. The event itself is, is just amazing. And the networking is amazing. Uh, but you also get access to, besides the, the live trainings, you get, we record everything. You get access to all of that through the event. So until the event ends, so basically the 25th or realistically probably like the 26th or so, or so um, of February. So you know, we've got sort of like, hey, where do you start, right? You want to go through my RBC method? You want to be trained on upsells by Justin? Um, you know, the down sales, the checkout page, like these are all hour and a half long trainings that we've done for our members. Um, you know, recent calls, Justin and I just broke down a sales letter over two weeks. Um, we've done stuff about how to grow your business and, and things like that, what your 2021 focuses are. And then we have this giant plethora of, of, of just two plus years of trainings we've done, like leads, headlines, fascinations, emotional storytelling, closes, coming up with big ideas. I've taught RMBC in a couple uh, different times. Um, the last of our research, headline mistakes, the first line of copy. We break down sales letters, um, dissecting winning offers. We've had different bonus calls like Chris Wright, like uh, who's a great copywriter I mentioned earlier, doing a breakdown. Um, mistakes that affect how you scale offers. We have specific trainings on email copy. If you're focused on that, here's like the, the Bible of how to write great email copy. Um, how to boost conversions, tons of stuff you can apply to any funnel or you can apply to your clients' funnels, get them big wins, do it on performance basis and get paid on it. Um, talking about copywriting business and strategy, we've always, we've done calls with our freelancers about strategies and things that we share today and specific advice, specific case studies. You can watch all of these. 
we have open frame Q and A's, people like Chris Haddad have come in and taught, um, all kinds of folks. We've got stuff on Facebook compliance. And then, yeah, for light, again, all the calls that Brian has already done um, on the business of freelancing, you want to watch the one that just happened today. It'll be put up here like later on today or tomorrow. Um, so you can watch all, you get access to all these trainings. So here's Brian's right here. Um, so again, he's got another one that will be added uh, shortly here. There's one from December 23rd, January 6th. Um, so literally Brian is just helping people and you, you, you can go on this call live next week. Um, but it's really, Brian's like helping you with like negotiating your pitch, how to like charge more, how to make sure your rates, how to get clients to say yes to you. I mean, if you sign up, you know, and, and apply for your ticket and get accepted before, um, you know, next week, you can be on this call with Brian picking his brain and gain individual attention. And you can begin individual copy feedback and reviews. And like we have a huge Facebook group of ridiculous resources as well. Um, final notes, you get the recordings from our previous events, including the one in September that um, all of our panelists mentioned being amazing. You get the um, ones from our event last year in February, the recordings, and even our first one in, in uh, September. So that's all included when you buy your ticket. All you have to do is apply. And when you do apply, just remember, like, this is not a, um, like, we're not, like, we're not dicks about the application stuff. We want to make sure you're not a dick. That's what the application is all about. So whether, you know, it doesn't matter if you're brand new or you're seasoned in experience, um, you belong in our community as long as you're coming with a desire to mentor and share and to provide value or and to, to be, you know, to receive value. So the reason for the application is if you come and you're like a total a-hole, then we don't want you. Um, but, you know, if it doesn't matter where you are in your career, we, we want to help you. And we worked with and had attendees who are anywhere from brand new beginners just starting out, like Matt Murphy was just starting out, having tons of success now. Krista was just starting out at the last event, tons of success now. Um, you know, to people who are more seasoned and they're growing and, and uh, thriving as well, like Heidi or Sam or whoever. So truly um, hope you apply. It's just, uh, to me, you know, the events are life-changing. Can I, I want to say something if, you, if I have a minute. You have the best NPR voice ever, so you can talk whenever you want. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, okay, so... As Justin said earlier about like find or Justin or Stefan, somebody said something about having a hype man, right? Yeah. And here's the thing about coming to this event. It's so easy to have people be your hype men when you come to these events and when you like go into the group and you interact and you introduce yourself and you, you know, comment on posts and you do stuff like that. It's so easy to get other people, even very experienced people recommending you to clients that uh, they've worked with, people that they've worked with, people that they're currently working with. Because the biggest shift in my, you know, copywriting journey has been that there is, there is an infinite amount of jobs available in copywriting, in direct response copywriting, because the same client that hires me for emails will hire five other people, 10 other people, 20 other people for emails even though they'll keep hiring me over and over again, they'll hire other people too, because it's all about testing. So there is literally, there's no finite amount of testing that you can do. And so it's an infinite amount of availability for projects. And so if you think that like, oh, I'm going to come to the event, but I'm not that new. So if I want to write emails like Jared does, well, e Jared's going to get that. No, because not everybody wants to pay $500 an email, which is what I'm going to charge. But if I know somebody, and I do this a lot, actually, if I know somebody and I'm, you know, friends with them, like sure as hell, I'm going to recommend people who come to me who want to work with me to other people. And I'm their hype man then. And like, it's very easy to get other people in this community to hype you up. You just have to be active and you have to be, you know, you have to be out there. You have to put yourself out there at least a little bit. So that's it. No, I love that. It was so true. I mean, again, think about um, like this, you know, we did the four scholarship tickets, right? And that was all from our members. And it was like people like Jay DeBolt and Steve Gunn and, and a mix of freelancers and offer owners. Um, and then when we, we decided to do those things where we were like, hey, we're going to create gigs for our, our writers and like, who wants to put up, you know, $15,000? And it was like three or four of our members of, of Copic Sorry, business owners immediately said, oh, I want to do that. Um, and like you, you meet those people. I'm not saying that that means you're going to get one of the, we're going to do those jobs. We, we'll probably will do more of those in the future. Um, we kind of took a break because we're going to the event, but we'll probably do more. But again, those are all people who, if you build a relationship with them, if you talk with them, you get to know them. 
um, like they're a lot of them will be open to hiring you to testing you out. And like Jared just said, that's a huge secret. I mean, because people are like, oh, they already have a bunch of copywriters. So like, yeah, and they want more. Like you're constantly as an I, I've owned many offers and been a business owner and I am actively, you're constantly looking for talent and for diamonds, but like, you know, polished diamonds, sure, but diamonds in the rough that you can cultivate. Like you're constantly looking for that because you always need more copy. There's always so many projects going on. Um, there's not a scarcity, there's an abundance. I'm always, I'm shocked by how many of the top offer owners are just constantly hiring copywriters. I mean, they're obsessive about it. So building those relationships, whether it means like a job on day one of the event or it means in a month from now or a month after the event, you know, maybe it's a little bit longer, but, but those relationships will multiply. So it's just really valuable. And, and another note too, is everyone, our panelists here who are amazing, um, you know, they're all paying members of Copy Accelerator, but they're here trying to get you to buy a ticket and come to the event because they know how valuable and life-changing it is. And I just love that. And then you look in the chat, I mean, Jazz Courtney, like I mean, called out Jazz, he's been sharing gems too. Um, you know, John Caprani crushing it in this chat, like Matt Murphy, I've, talk, I've called out. But like, you know, we have, our members are all here, like encouraging you to come join us, right? Like what, what a crazy community is that, you know? I mean, like, it, it, like that's what you get at the event. You get to meet these people and spend time with them in person and talk at tables and chat. And, and it's just, it's invaluable. So I'll shut up. But like I said, here's, I'll put the link in the chat one more time and we would just love for you to apply and to, to attend. Um, it would just be awesome to have you. Yeah, well, one last thing I'll add is a couple of people mentioned the, the date to sign up. Uh, probably like I would say the last day you could really sign up would maybe be about, I don't know, like February 18th or so. Uh, Blake will probably stop doing calls, I would say around the 20th. Uh, and you have to do a call with Blake in order to see if you're a fit. So. Yeah, somewhere, I would say somewhere around there. So if you want to get on Blake's calendar, uh, either at the end of this week or early next week, I would book the call now. Um, yeah, so some sometime before the 18th would probably be your last chance to uh, to get a ticket. And uh, if you've already been to the event, you can just go buy a ticket. But if you're if you're new, you need you need to do the application and um, talk with Blake. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that about wraps everything up. Uh, thank you again, guys, for coming on the call. I'm gonna post the link to the, the Google Doc that we use. Uh, the link to Copy Accelerator to the sales page is in there if you wanna read it and sign up, if you want, or I mean, if you wanna apply to, to come to the event. Uh, I'm glad you guys all showed up for this. I'm glad uh, all the panelists came in and dropped all their wisdom as well. Yeah, and girls. Yeah, you guys, you guys definitely, definitely added a lot to it. Um, and yeah, so this will get posted on YouTube. Uh, I'll send it out to my email list probably sometime tonight and we'll post it in the Facebook group as well. But uh, thanks again for showing up. Thanks again for participating. And we hope to see everyone at the event in a couple of weeks. Thank you everyone.